connections. Would that work for MariaDB? Have you tested it with MariaDB? Yes, I, I did try it with MariaDB, and I wanted to use it, but I like that MySQL workbench. And I was in, uh, yesterday, I was in one of the... Oh, the MariaDB. The yeah, oh, yeah, and I asked about that specifically. And he said, it will connect with MariaDB if you use that MySQL workbench. Because you can right. create your schema, and then you just press a button, and it'll create all the databases yep. for you. And if I would have known that, I would have stuck with MariaDB yeah, yeah, and yeah. just used my SQL workbench. But I didn't know it could do it at the time. All right. So All right. yeah, good question. Thanks. thanks. Excellent. Oh, Thank yeah, thanks. So uh, so anyway, as you know, as I was uh, just mentioning, uh, Michael's got a ton of videos there. So if you want to you want to learn more about uh, LibreOffice Base, that's the site to go to. Yeah, especially um, if you're a visual learner. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because yeah, those videos, our videos yeah. are great. And you so. can just subscribe on YouTube, which is what I do. Okay. So about uh, once a week, I get a notification. He has a, a new video out. Great. Right. Yep. And if uh, if uh, you find that these videos are helpful, then you you should consider making a donation. There's a little donation button. Just want you to know I donated to your uh, just now. Um, oh, great. <laughs> that's, that's one thing I'm very big on um, because we do have uh, we we're able to make use of the software for. Free, both free in terms of uh, right. cost and just the freedom that open source provides. So if it's helpful, donate a few dollars. Yeah, you know, that's that's, I'm a big I'm a big supporter of that too. It, so. If if you find that software useful, throw just a couple of bucks their way. Almost every project out there has a donate button on their site. Yep. Yeah. So, so when you, yours did too. It was right there. It was very yep. helpful. I have a little tr trouble finding it because of muscle memory. I was typing frugal the way Google spells it. <laughs> F R O O. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Oh, anyway, so, um, but that was my little mini review. I had a chance to take a look at that. And, uh, my All right. So, awesome. Cool. So, do we want to go on to our other special thing right now, the audience participation, or are we going to do that later? I thought we'd do it near the end. Near the end when we do it. Uh, okay. All right, the next, next up we have is the news. 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 So, Matt, there was none. Have you found <laughs> the news? I did. I found two stories. I have them on my phone, so bear with me for a second. Okay. <laughs> The well, first phone is almost as big as a tablet. I <laughs> <laughs> the first one comes from PC World, and it's called World Beyond Windows, exploring Linux, Chrome OS, and beyond. And it's Debian 8 Jesse is out, and even Microsoft is celebrating. <laughs> the wait is over. Debian 8 Jesse were released on April 25th, after nearly two years in development. And Microsoft is even throwing Debian a birthday party, complete with cake. So, if Bill Gates were dead, he'd be spinning in his grave. <laughs> so does Microsoft throw a birthday party like Game of Thrones throws a wedding? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> the cake is a lot. So that was on. That was on. Uh, what, what site was that? PC World, and then it was also got mentioned on by Microsoft themselves. Join the Microsoft Openness team to celebrate Debian 8 at Linux Fest Northwest. That one's right, right from Microsoft themselves. I that's happening on right now. That's happening yeah. this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. In Bellingham, Washington. I, I would think they'd have a big presence there just because it's so close to Right, me. sure. Right. And then the other one I found was on Tech Dirt, and it's an Irish legislator proposes law that would make annoying people online a crime. So, <laughs> and that's why I said he'd be in jail. If I were in Ireland, if I were in Ireland, I'd be locked up. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> but no, what it is is Ireland has always had some very strict anti-harassment laws, and they tried to update them just by changing some wording, and it's not going to work out so well. <laughs> so, and that's on Tech Third if you want to check that out. And that's the two stories I. Had. Well, a serious topic. That's that's something I feel very strongly about. I mean, this the stuff on Facebook where the you know the the kids are horrible to each other these days. Nothing like I remember when I was in school. But you know the the stuff that the police can enforce, like actual death threats or things like that. But beyond that, uh, you know, I, you you don't have a right not to be offended. 
So, I, and we, we have these other people coming in, and like schools saying, oh, you can't, you can't say that you don't like uh, Fred on Facebook and that he shouldn't come to school. We're saying, well, you know, that's, that's free speech. It's wrong. People shouldn't do it. But it, it gets kind of scary when you get Big Brother coming in and trying to legislate, you know, what your, you know, what you can express about opinions of other people. So where, where does that end? Is, you know, if I express online that I don't like Microsoft software, you know, can they, should they come shut me down or sue me because I said something, you know, derogatory about not, not libelous or anything like that, but I've said, I've said something, well, I don't, I don't think they uh, do business the right way. So, you know, that I, the, once you get this started with Big Brother coming in, and even more scary, the schools deciding to take it on themselves, uh, to, to take authority they really don't have under the law, uh, I just don't see where it stops. All right. Um, well, I, I, I think I think one of the things that we're not really considering when we talk about that topic is the fact that um, if a kid doesn't like another kid, it's a lot different these days when it goes out in a public forum yes. where it's viewed by millions of people, which could cause. I think a significant amount of humiliation for that child who is being bullied. So, you know, I, I, I certainly, I certainly understand the whole idea about you know free speech, but on the other hand, um, I just think that the venues today that kids have access to in order to put that stuff out there really, um, um, well, you know, needs to be considered too. Well, people, but these people, slippery slope. They, right? People yeah. ought to have a thicker skin. Is, no. is the is the main slope? Uh, people. Parents ought to be telling their kids, well, consider the source. If this, you know, you know this uh, person who's criticizing you is a jerk already to you in class. Why, you know, why does it make di any difference to you what they say about you on Facebook? Don't go look at Facebook if you don't like it. Well, so, anyway, moving on. Yeah, did, did you I'm sorry to interject <laughs> a, serious, a serious topic. Hey, I mean, we just say and tell these kids is, when it comes to like getting in the heat argument on the internet, just remember, what would Linus do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. See, I was going to do that, but I knew you would anyway. All right, well, I've got a couple of news items. There we go. What, what do you got going there, Mary? Well, um, one was, um, this came out on April 21st. It was in um, uh, the New York Times blogs. Smart city technology may be vulnerable to hackers. Which you know, on the face of the sheet, shocker. <laughs> but you know, when you think about the whole Internet of Things and how um, this the so-called smart technology, which um, I'm sorry, I'm never going to buy an iWatch or whatever they call yeah. that thing. Um, I'm never going to have I'm never going to have a tracking device on me 24 hours a day or whatever. That's just not going to happen. Got a cell phone? Oh, oh yes, I have a cell phone. But the difference is, is that I can I can leave my cell phone. I'm not going to be wearing it. Um, I don't wear my cell phone. I have it. I have it with me um, a fair amount of the time. But I don't. Um, I leave my cell phone at home sometimes. I don't have it with they me. They know that. <clears throat> so that. They know that. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, but my, the whole point about the whole smart technology is that um, last year there was an Argentinian um, security researcher um, at this particular uh, lab. And he demonstrated how 200,000 traffic control sensors installed in major hubs like Washington, New York, New Jersey, San Francisco, uh, France, just a number of different places, were vulnerable to attack. He showed how information coming from these sensors could be intercepted from 1,500 feet away, or even by drone, uh, because one company had failed to encrypt traffic. And then, last Sunday, he reported uh, he had tested the same uh, traffic sensors <coughs> in San Francisco one year later and found that some of them were still not encrypted. So, to me, it's, it should really be a wake-up call for our public officials that if we're going to be putting this technology in place like this for our convenience, we also really need to put um, security above that so that we don't end up uh, having all these things hacked and you know creating a whole bunch of problems for ourselves. So that was one article I saw that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to say anything about that, but well, not, no. it's it's uh, no nobody in the public is going to take this seriously that 
encrypting these systems is something needs to be uh, needs to be done. The, uh, the politicians aren't go aren't going to do anything about it until somebody do does a cyber uh, a deliberate cyber assassination, comes up beside behind somebody and plays with their pacemaker, or changes all the traffic lights to to cause accidents, or hacks into the drive-by wire systems of your car, which if you know, anybody has got a late model fuel injected engine, you don't have a throttle cable going from your foot feed to your throttle anymore. You, ha you have a potentiometer on your throttle that's telling the computer where to, where to set your uh, engine speed. Uh, similar, I, if we get into more electronic systems on the brakes, things like that, that it's gonna be quite possible uh, at least the cars aren't networked yet, but I, I think a lot of this is, is they, uh, with, with all of the stuff in the news about high-speed chases the, the last 10 years, I, I, you know, I, I think they're going to come out one day and say, hey, the, cop, the cops now have the ability to shut off your engine remotely, and if you don't have a, if you don't have a late model car, you can't drive anymore. So, That's right. And, you know, and they've actually had the technology to do that for a long time. The cops could call in to OnStar and have them shut mm -hmm. off the car. Yeah, if uh, that was done. If it was a GM vehicle. Yeah, if it was a GM. Um, <coughs> and you, but I ran into that same problem just the other day with my car. I now they're using it for wireless. GM's the only company that has wireless in the car. No, oh, right. Mm -hmm. You mean uh, not the only? They were Wi-Fi. Yeah, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. Wi-Fi. They, they're internet. not the only, but they were the first. I'm talking about. I'm talking about internet kind of. Yeah, so right now. yeah. I think Ford has a thing in it. Their trucks now. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it, it, is that a vector? I mean, if it's all tied into the same, if that Wi-Fi is all tied into the same computer, I mean, that's what something we're talking about in the Internet of Things. That I think it was that if you could isolate the computer to drive the car, you know, versus the computer for all the convenience things, that they were two separate systems. That that would be one thing. But I bet if you, I bet if you looked at this new GM system with the Wi-Fi. If you could hack the Wi-Fi, I bet you would be into all the engine systems. Well, I wouldn't, I'm sorry, I wouldn't bet on that. Yeah, no. they keep them fairly segregated. Yeah. No, he's on, did you see the 60 Minutes and then the follow-up, there's a great podcast Steve Gibson put together with the guys who hacked the car that shows by hacking the systems in the car, they did a remote exploit through the radio that disabled the brakes. So no, they're not a yeah. separate and they oh, they did a remote a concept. Exploit they did to the radio on, that disabled the brakes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they I they, they showed this. They demoed it. It's not theory. They uh, did it in the car. Uh, they wouldn't say they obscured the vehicle, but they said they're not. This isn't the only vulnerable model vehicle. That is the only thing they would add to it. Uh, again, you know, they can put this out there and. Nothing's going to get done until somebody dies in an accident and, well, they, and they prove that that's what happened. Having it on 60 Minutes was the goal was to embarrass the automakers. Right, right. Because they're showing the public, not just saying theoretically someone could do this, right. you go watch us disable the brakes in the parking lot and the control set, uh, you, you lose control of the car and you let the reporter drive the car. She goes, that's really creepy that I can't stop this car. Yeah, but if they really wanted to do it, they'd go out on the freeway and come up behind a guy and just disable his brakes. <laughs> ah, watch this guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I do it. I don't know if that's the way everyone would do it. <laughs> they admitted right. physical access was necessary. All right. Um, next up. Next up, uh, Microsoft continues earning money from Linux uh, incre uh, by increasing uh, patent licensing agreements. Um, this article uh, came out a couple days ago. Uh, what happened is that, uh, for those of you who are not aware, Microsoft has alleged that uh, the Linux uh, or Android, Android infringes uh, patents. Infringes on uh, several uh, patents, although they've never, they have yet to reveal what those patents are. Yes. <clears throat> but what they've done then is they've scared these uh, little phone vendors who are using Android into um, <coughs> buying licenses for these alleged violations. Right. But, but they still don't know what But they've never <laughs> said to Google you <coughs> have to buy a license, so. I think they earn a couple billion dollars. I mean, yeah, they, they earn a ton of money annually. Before on Windows 7 came out, it was their largest revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So uh, this article on, um, on Friday talked about these two Taiwanese companies, 
which I think are the, um, the, the latest two, and I think all the Taiwanese phone companies now license uh, the Android technology from Microsoft. Um, uh, that they, they have, uh, you know, you said, and also Chromebooks too, they collect money from Chromebooks. Yeah, but I, I not, again, not, not from Google. Not from Google. From the individual manufacturers. So you'd think that if this were legit, they'd go after Google. Right, right? but yeah. it's not, and they know Google has the pockets to prove, it, the deep pockets mm -hmm. to prove it's not legit. They're actually trying to use Can I make a, if, if, if you want to talk, oh, yeah. come the mic, to the mic. mic. Yeah, so our, our listeners can hear. <laughs> No, it actually hasn't been too bad. The, the okay. Samsung, Samsung right now is like the largest single payer to Microsoft on the licensing, and they have this close to them under a NDA. That's why Samsung writes them that billion dollar check a year. But a lot of it, as I understand, is uh, legal precedence building, because at some point they can go look at everyone that's paying, and then they take Google to court with a lot of case precedents that, look, these guys pay. You're talking, you know, Samsung and these side of these companies. Once they have a list of them to pay, that's kind of their legal strategy to eventually hit Google. But if you hit Google first and lose, well, the other guys wouldn't have followed suit. So if you start with the small guys, they can't lawyer up like mm -hmm. Google can, mm -hmm. and they build a case precedence. It's going to happen within the next two years. They're going to hit Google with this lawsuit. Yeah, but precedent but, isn't going to replace fact. No, it's not. I'm, I'm <laughs> so, with you. I'd love to show me the money. Show exactly. Me the money. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good point. That's a good point. Thank you very much. Um, and then my final, um, final article was uh, Google's Nexus 7, which I've got one here under the table. <laughs> on the floor, uh, they have decided to discontinue it. It's no longer for sale on Google's website. Um, it was a great, uh, it was a great little tablet. This was uh, on the verge. Um, the, the website, theverge.com, it's <laughs> on the verge of being discontinued <laughs> um, on uh, April 25th. So I think it was like Friday or yesterday. Yesterday's the 25th, right? So, sure. uh, so it's kind of sad. I've got my, you know, they said I've got it down here on the floor, we um, believe you. charging. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to share that. And Matt, of course, claimed that his uh, this large, uh, <laughs> well, it's a Nexus, what, five? Yeah, six. Oh, six. Okay. All right. So it's uh, pretty good size. Yes. This phone, this tablet, yeah. phonelet. The, pho the phablet. Phablet. <laughs> there you go. Um, so anyway, so those are, those are my little news items. All right. Yeah, and I found two items also. Uh, the first one came up was Comcast admits defeat and terminates Time Warner merger. Yeah. <laughs> right to the consumers. That's right. Um, and that's the headline. I didn't get to actually. Oh. Where, where is the story? Huh? Where is that story? It's on ARS Technica. ARS Technica. Ars Technica. Technica. And the link will be in the show notes. But I, you know, I figured the uh, headline alone is is enough to, uh, you know, for news. Because yes. uh, we've talked about it in the past, and almost every single podcast I've listened to has all talked about how um, having that big of a Comcast uh, would be a problem. They couldn't convince uh, the uh, FTC or the FCC that uh, it wouldn't affect innovation and it wouldn't uh, result in increased prices for consumers? Shocker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Shocker. Although I did hear a rumor there's another company, um, I think that I was in talks money, with Time Warner that now they may start that again, but it's not Comcast, so, I mean, that, the yeah. outcome of that discussion may be Charter and Bright House? Yeah, yeah. They, they, so they, they, maybe something else there, but Comcast and Time Warner would be just too, too, too big to fail. <laughs> <laughs> it would become too big to fail or something, so. All right. That's right, and then my second article I have is Samsung 5, said to have security flaw that leaks your fingerprint to hackers. Uh, and Ooh, like the iPhone. Huh? iPhone had an exploit where it would leak your fingerprint too. Yeah. So it says in here that network only needs to get system level access to be able to get to confidential data. And as like your thumb Sure, sure. Uh, and where was that story? And that is on Softpedia. Uh, but they said that if you are running 4.4, then that's when you have the problem. But if you've upgraded to the 5.0, uh, then that has been patched, so I am no longer uh, uh, vulnerable to that. Because uh, you have no fingerprints? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, I did do that upgrade a while ago. Uh, so that's the best reason right now to go to the Lollipop is upgrade so you don't get your fingers print stolen. All right. Well, All right. That sounds good. I don't even have a fingerprint device, though, so. And you know, people well, use that. Five. People would, built right in. Yeah. The button right there is a fingerprint reader. Right. No. And, yes, yeah. it is. But uh, 
a lot of people think about that as wrong, okay? A fingerprint or an iris scan should not be your password. It should be your username. It should be, hi, this is me. I'm proving this is me. Now let me enter my password to unlock my stuff. Okay, that's what a biometric should be. It should be a username, not a password. People are thinking about this way wrong. Well, thanks, Matt. That's a good point. Yeah. All right, that's all okay. I had. So you have a key corner or? Um, all I want to say is that uh, Kubuntu 1504, which you just saw, was released. Um, and uh, I don't really have any uh, key to EIDs this week, unfortunately. All right. But I have, I have one convention scene. Convention scene, all yeah. right. So um, we're going to move on now to the Linux convention scene. Uh, we're going to let you know where you ought to be next month, uh, at least. <laughs> if, you if, you <laughs> if you want to be Linuxy, if you want to be Linuxy or something like that, um, we've got um, uh, May first through the fourth at uh, Den Haag, the Netherlands, which is the Hague. We've got the Open SUSE conference at the Westlake uh, Sports Center. This uh, Open SUSE conference will bring together a wide variety of free and open source contributors to collaborate on one of the major Linux distribution projects. They've got six different conference tracks, including business uh, and outcome, project and OSS leadership, community and collaboration, technology and security, the Collab Summit, and then they also will have LPI exams there. Um, and I've got, I'll have a link to that in the show notes. It's still a flight. Um, the next one is the Coral West Fest on May 4th through the 5th, 2015 in, in uh, San Francisco, California. CoreOS, and this was kind of interesting because we, you know, the CoreOS, the... Uh, right. Uh, I tried to use it once. I tried to review it once. <laughs> it's like just the core. It's like the kernel and right. not much more. Right. Uh, I tried to use it to build uh, a thin client on top of, and it just didn't work out so well. Well, this, I think this might be a little bit different. It says CoreOS is designed for security, consistency, and reliability. Instead of installing packages via Yum or App, CoreOS uses Linux containers to manage your services at a higher level of abstraction. So I think it just takes CoreOS and then bolts these things on. Um, <clears throat> a single service code and all dependencies are packaged within a container that can be run as one or many CoreOS machines. So uh, this is actually the very first CoreOS Fest. As I mentioned, it's going to be out in San Francisco. There will be a link to that particular uh, convention in the show notes. Uh, the next one up is May 7th through the 9th. Uh, it's the Open West. Uh, convention, tech conference. It's out at the Utah Valley University Science Building in Orem, Utah. It's the largest regional tech conference devoted to all things open, hardware standards, source, and data. Open West works closely with many of the local user groups to plan and develop and operate the conference. There'll be a link to that. Uh, next one, this is great. This is the OSCAL 2015, the Open Source Conference Albania. Ooh. <laughs> That, that hub of technology, Albania. Yes. It's at the Freedom Building at the University of Tirana in Tirana, Albania. The flagship open source conference in the Balkans. Ooh. Balkans. Um, organized to promote software freedom, open source software, open knowledge, and global movement that originally started more than 25 years ago. So that's May 9th through the 10th. Um, there'll be a link to that. We've got two more left. Um, May 18th through the 22nd at the Vancouver Convention Center in Vancouver, British Columbia. We've got um, the OpenStack uh, Conference. The summit, it's actually the OpenStack Summit. It's a five-day conference for OpenStack contributors, enterprise users, service providers, uh, developers, and ecosystem members. This is um, it's a great place, they said, to get started with OpenStack. I think that's a pay one. Um, but again, that is um, May 18th through the 22nd. And finally, we oui, oui, gay Paris. Uh, we have Solutions Linux 15 at the CNET Paris, La Défense Française, the 20th to the 21st of May 2015. Now, Solutions Linux is one of the major corporate events in France about Linux and open source solutions. The, the event will also host an open source community village. Uh, there's, there, they will have a group of BSD enthusiasts there too, so that be, that's kind of good to see. Um, and that is, as I said, is going to be in Paris, France. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is this month's or next month's uh, Linux The upcoming months. Yes, right. <laughs> Linux convention scene. Back to you, Tony. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so, we're, what's up next? Well, I think, oh. what's up next? <laughs> Who's on first? I'll tell you what's on first. Um, we, uh, you know, when, I, when we were talking about uh, 
before we start recording what uh, our, our typical episode uh, looks like. Uh, we mentioned the um, uh, Is It Alive segment, and uh, we, we also mentioned this uh, this episode. We've got a crowd uh, crowdsourced one, not crowdsourced, but, but a crowd participation yeah. one. We're going to involve you all. Yes. <laughs> so what we like, uh, what we're going to be doing is we are going to um, we're going to um, ask a trivia question. Yeah. And uh, we would like you to guys to shout out the answer if you know it. So. Uh, <coughs> Um, let me know when you're ready to start. You guys ready? Who's Are you ready? Participating? Who's going to participate? Come All on. right. Come on. Right. More than one guy has to raise their hand out there. All Two right. Guys. Three guys. All right. We'll see what happens here. All right. Here's the first question. Uh, Ken Thompson, one of the co-inventors of Unix, runs what operating system on his home computer? This is multiple choice. He, does he run Mac OS? Does he run FreeBSD? Does he run Linux? Or does he run Unix? Again, Ken Thompson, one of the co-inventors of the Unix operating system. What does he run on his home computer? Back. BSD. Thanks for playing. BSD. Thanks for playing. It's going to be Unix. And thanks for playing. Really? He runs Linux. Ah. <laughs> and this was based on a 2009 interview um, that, uh, that I found. So um, no one got that. So yeah, it, was it, was, it was a great question because it was not what you would expect. <laughs> no. Because uh, I really thought he would have run, run Mac or, I, or BSD. I thought he would run for BSD. As a yeah. disclaimer at home, I usually do worse than man. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in, the, uh, in the slash Etsy directory, those of you who are familiar with uh, the directory structure in Linux, uh, and well, actually Unix has it too, um, in BSD. Uh, there is a file called fstab, mm -hmm. which is short for, this is multiple choice, is it file start tabulature, file start at tag locks, file system table, uh, file scan <laughs> tag file locks, system table. or first system table? File system table. Yep. I should have not given them those choices. <laughs> <laughs> I was going through a tech glossary trying to come up with different names. And, uh, I could have just answered that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, the next one. In addition to co-inventing the Unix operating system, Ken Thompson is credited with authoring this well-known um, item, I'll call it. Uh, is C. It? C. It's not a choice. Not a choice. <laughs> Wait for the choices. That's right. <laughs> Please get your hands off the buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is it ASCII? Is it UTF-8? Is it Unicode? Or is it Hypertext Transfer Protocol? ASCII. HTTP. Uh, ASCII is not correct. HTTP is not correct. COVID, UTF-8. You are correct. UTF-8. And why wouldn't Unicode be correct? Because because UTF-8 is a Unicode. Right, but Unicode is, is in one, coding. Right? And uh, Unicode is Unicode is a character set, and UTF-8 is the encoding. The specific character set. Yeah, it's yeah. it is a Unicode. UTF-8 is a Unicode. Yeah. Okay. What's the encoding of it? UTF-8 is a Unicode. Then there's UTF-32, UTF-16, mm -hmm. and they're all Unicode. Here's a bonus. What does UTF-8 stand for? Does anybody know what the UTF-8 stands for? Unified Translation Code? Not that bad. That's, that's pretty good. All right. It's universal. That, you got to start. Yeah. That's got the U. What's the TF? Translation format. I, I'm Close. Just... Tra yeah, it's, it's, it's um, uh, Universal transformation form. It's, it's actually a universal character set transformation form. It's the full okay. one. So that's pretty good, Kevin. Uh, yeah, very good. Um, now, the next two, now these came from you guys, a question. Do you want to ask them yourselves? Or? No, you can continue. No, keep going. <laughs> keep going it's, all, it's all you, Mary. Oh, uh, yeah. It's all on me. Okay. Um, all right. Why is the Linux mascot a penguin? It attacked Linus. That is a common misnomer. It's just his favorite uh, animal. Yes, he just likes penguins. <laughs> That's right. 
Okay, um, when was Linux 1.0 released? We all know that 4.0, that Linux kernel um, 4.0 was released a few weeks ago. When was the Linux kernel 1.0 released? Was it I'm sorry, we'll take just a year. What was your? No, no, what year did you say? 1993. 1993. I'd say 1991. No, no. 1991 is when he first released it, but it wasn't at 1.0 then. Uh, you're very close, though. Yeah, since we're taking just a year, you're very close. 94. There you go. <laughs> it was actually uh, March 14, 1994. So